Chapter 6 is one of my favourite chapters. It deals with the logistics of the ark. How did everything fit into the ark? Where did they put all the food? And how did they survive after the flood? But now ask the beasts and they will teach you, and the birds of the air and they will tell you, or speak to the earth and it will teach you, and the fish of the sea will explain to you, who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? in whose hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. A very interesting study was done by Dr. John Wood Murapi. In addition to many other aspects, he made an accurate calculation of the minimum number of animals that had to be in the ark to realistically account for the great variety of animals in existence today. It is far less than what most of you may think because the original created kind on the ark was not on the species level of today's taxonomic classification but rather on the family level as mentioned in the second lecture. Some people have this picture in their mind of an ark that looks like a massive floating wooden bath you know with it's some brownish ship-like structure with the heads of adult giraffes and elephants and of course Noah sticking out on top as they are waving goodbye to no one. The Bible is very clear about the size of the ark. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits and its height 30 cubits. In common language the ark was 140 meters long, 23 meters wide and 14 meters high. This means that the ark was longer than a soccer field and higher than a four-story building. It had three decks with a volume capacity of 43,200 cubic meters. Korean shipbuilders found the ark, as described in the Bible, to be one of the most stable forms able to handle a rough sea, rough sea conditions. It's able to withstand three times hurricane strength winds and up to 30 meter high waves without toppling over. However, this does not necessarily mean that the ark would not withstand waves even higher than 30 meters. Keep in mind that terrible things were on the go in Earth's crust during the flood. Tectonic plate movements, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, boiling fountain water, bursting forth, rushing to and fro. It was wild. Of course, it wasn't necessary for the Ark to have a streamlined cruise ship design. Where would it cruise to anyway? Wave number 777328416. Everything was underwater. The Ark only needed to stay afloat. Trajan was a Roman emperor. He had an animal collection which was comparable to that of Noah. The collection included wild and domestic animals. King Solomon also had many animals with about 4,000 stables just for his horses. These animal collections are called a menagerie. According to Genesis 6.19 and also 7.2, it is clear that God instructed Noah to gather the animals for the ark. And of every living thing, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. Noah could have used hired help or his own servants to gather the animals, just like the emperors did in those days. It was common in ancient times for people to have huge animal collections. So Noah didn't have to run around all day to try and catch each animal. Can you imagine how old Noah, Noah at his advanced age would have struggled to catch a rabbit, especially if they were already wearing those long dresses? Furthermore, it is written that God commanded the animals to follow Noah into the ark. Of the birds after their kind, of, of the animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. And they went into the ark to Noah, and two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. Clearly, Noah was inside the ark at that stage. In other words, God and Noah were both directly involved in selecting and gathering the animals for the ark.
Noah probably built up an animal collection in anticipation of the flood and then God supernaturally commandeered these animals into the ark. This process would have had many advantages and you can read all about that in the book. Um, when Obviously when animals are handled by people they get used to people far quicker and stronger animals are selected. Now, as we can clearly see from this verse, God did not tell Noah to take one pair of every animal kind in existence into the ark, but only the, the land animals that breathed air. Furthermore, only the original kinds, meaning the family level of classification, were taken into the, into the ark. Not every single species, subspecies, and variation alive today. We've spoken about classification in the second lecture, but let's quickly recap. The scientific names for living organisms consist of two parts, namely the genus and the species. The lion's surname and name is Panthera leo, and the leopard is Panthera pardus. Both are classified under the same genus, Panthera, and both, together with all the other cat species and variations, are also classified under the same family name, Felidae, the cat family. This is how it's done for all living organisms. So there are more species than genuses, more genuses than families, etc. The biblical record, the list of animals in Leviticus, indicate that the original kind was the equivalent to the subfamily or family level of today's classification, at least with regards to birds and mammals. This has been scientifically verified through various documented case studies of hybridization between different species and different genera. Remember, we looked at the liger and the zonkey and the wolf and etc. Let's have another quick look at dogs as an example. We've also spoken about this in the second lecture, but let's repeat that as well. The upper box contains the original wolf dog kind, probably at the family or subfamily level of Linaus's system of classification. The very bottom row of animals represent what we today refer to as species or sometimes genera. They don't naturally reproduce with each other, mainly because of behavioral and regional differences. Strictly speaking though, reproduction is still possible between these species because all of their genetic information originates from the original wolf-dog kind. Stated differently, a group of living animals, in this case wolves, dogs and foxes, belong to the same original kind on family level if they are descendants of that same original gene pool. Today there are more than 200 distinct dog varieties. This includes the wolves, the foxes, jackals and prairie wolves. Together with your domestic animal, your Great Dane and your Chihuahua as well, they all originate from one wolf kind. The number of recombinations that can arise through reproduction is 10 to the power of 30,000. To put this into perspective, you have to consider the number of atoms in the universe, which is estimated at 10 to the power of 80. Clearly, the original wolf-dog kind were able to produce enormous amounts of variation. In fact, the number is so high that the number of atoms in the entire universe seems quite insignificant in comparison. And in addition, as mentioned in an earlier lecture, in the November 2002 Journal of Science, it was confirmed that all dogs are descended from wolves. The origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established. We can examine the mitochondrial DNA sequence variation among 654 dogs, representing all major dog populations worldwide, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations. From this, it should be quite clear that the age-old argument concerning the space problem in the ark would end if people would stop giving each animal five different names and then attempting to make it a problem for Noah. And yes, there were dinosaurs in the ark. Dinosaurs were simply another land animal, land animal kind that breathed air and that was created by God together with all the other land animals on day six. Did you know that most dinosaurs weren't even that big at all? Some were even smaller 
than chickens. The average, average size of an adult dinosaur was approximately that of a sheep. Shocking news. You mainly see or envision pictures of the giant T-Rex, especially it's given to you in books and shown on TV. Of the 668 so-called dinosaur genera, only 106 of them weighed more than 10 tons when they were adults. The largest egg ever hatched by a dinosaur was only slightly larger than a soccer ball. In other words, once upon a time. Even the biggest dinosaurs, for example, Apatosaurus and Brachiosaurus, used to be small, just like you and me. The younger and therefore smaller animals would have easily fitted into the ark. The average size of, size of all the animals on the ark was probably that of a large-sized rat, while only 11% of the animals in the ark were substantially larger than a sheep. Flying reptiles such as pterodactyls were also in the ark, but of course no sea reptiles such as plesiosaurs. We've all been brainwashed into believing that dinosaurs became extinct 65 million years ago, in other words, a long time before the flood. However, Genesis teaches that God made all the land animals on day 6, about 6,000 years ago. This includes the land-dwelling dinosaurs. And remember, according to God's word, nothing died before Adam and Eve sinned. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as through one man sin, in, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus spread to all men because all sinned. So it was not through Satan's sin as taught in the gap theory. So if you choose to believe the word of God in its entirety, then that should be sufficient to distinguish that blinding evolutionary light right there. But if you're still unsure, have a look at the very next presentation to see how an evolutionist discovery of red blood cells and soft tissue in T-Rex bones, as well as many other discoveries, confirm their young age. If it is true, as confirmed by the majority of scientific evidence, that the created kind was on the family level of taxonomic classification, at least with regards to birds and mammals, there would have been only 2,000 animals in the ark. However, Dr. Wood Murapi decided to make the whole exercise more interesting by deliberately making the problem of housing the animals more challenging in using the genus level instead of the family level as the tox taxonomic rank of the created kind. Remember, there are more genera than families Hereby, only 16,000, in other words, 8,000 pairs, would have been in the ark. If the 16,000 animals were in cages, they would have occupied 1,200 of the 43,200 cubic, uh, cubic meters volume of the ark. This means that the animals would have occupied only 2.8% of the ark. The other 97% could have been used for food and water, for playing games. And Here I was thinking that they were all crammed up inside like a tin of sardines. Another study was done to determine how long it would have taken the animals to board the ark. It was done by comparing the speed at a butchery where a thousand pigs per hour were being slaughtered. Naturally, the smaller animals would move faster than the bigger ones. But at this rate, it would have taken five hours to board the ark. Of course, the speed is applicable to a single row of animals, which was probably not the case. We can safely say that Noah had neither a fridge nor a refrigerator on board. Since the food could not be cooled or frozen, it must have been in the ark in a dry form. Whatever was taken on the ark could have been compressed. The bulk of various types of food can be drastically reduced by employing simple procedures such as the drying of fresh fruit and vegetables, which reduces the mass by 75 to 95 percent, especially when it's compressed at the same time. 
The preservation of food types also meat and fish for periods as long as three years has been known since ancient biblical times. The ancient Romans preserved berries in honey, while various foods such as berries and leaves and roots and fresh meat have been preserved for long periods in blubber or oil by the Arctic people. I elaborate a bit more on the preservation of food in the book. But just for interest sake, dried insects are highly nutritious. Indians of the American West used to dry large amounts of grasshoppers, which they then mixed with berries and seeds and nuts, a grasshopper health bar. It was then compressed into the shape of a cookie so that it could be stored for long periods. Clearly dried and concentrated foods would take up less space on the ark and also last longer. According to Wood Murapi, the amount of food needed for Noah, his family, as well as all the animals on board, would have taken up less than 15% of the ark's volume. This is discussed also in more detail in the book. If we add the 2,8% occupation by the animals to the 15% space needed for food, it amounts to 17,8%. If Noah took water as well, the amount would increase to 27,8%. The rest, more than 70%, and probably even more, was open space. And this clearly indicates that there was more than enough space for Noah, his family, all the animals, as well as for the food and water. There was a lot of space for playing hide and seek and touches and maybe even rugby. They could do push-ups and pull-ups and sprints. Maybe not Noah and his wife, but maybe their three sons and, and their wives. Sounds to me like very good planning. Now you're probably wondering about all that open space. Who was it for? Well, sadly, it was for the unbelievers who did not heed God's 120-year-long warning. Of course, the open space would have been even more if Noah had figured out a way to gather rainwater. And I think there was a lot of rainwater around. Never make the mistake of thinking that the people of the olden days were by any means less clever than we are. That is just another evolutionary idea. In fact, in Genesis 4, it is explained how Adam and his descendants were grain and stock farmers. They made musical instruments, forged metal, built cities. Shortly after the flood, the Egyptians learned how to write, how to cut granite, and how to build the pyramids with great precision, design, and fine detail, all without computers. Adam and Eve were created perfect. But since the fall, the mental ability of humans began to decline over a period of 6,000 years. It's quite convincing when looking at a few of these evolutionary ideas today. I think Noah was clever enough to figure out how to gather rainwater. Johan Habers is a Dutchman who decided to build a floating replica of Noah's Ark a few years ago. Although this Ark was only half the size of Noah's Ark, so that it could sail in the narrow Dutch canals, most people who saw it thought that it was enormous. When the writers of the article returned three years later for another visit to Johan, they discovered that this half-size ark was only a practice run. He was already busy with the actual project, which was to build a full-size fairing replica of Noah's ark. The project took four years and was completed in 2012. It has attracted thousands of visitors who undertake very interesting interactive tours in the ark, a wonderful way of spreading the truth. Here are some more photos with uh, permission from Jessica Habers and one from Mari Capers. And that's just to show the comparison between the full size and the half size arc. Fairly recently, in April of 2016, this 3,000 ton replica of Noah's Ark traveled via barge from the Le Netherlands to Brazil. The Ark of Noah Foundation, a US-based non-profit group, raised money to fund the trip and they live-streamed the entire way across. They also plan to visit other harbors through South, Middle and North America. And this Ark can carry 5,000 people. But this is not the only replica of Noah's Ark. 
In July 2016, Answers in Genesis opened their life-size replica of Noah's Ark in Kentucky. There's also a full-size concrete replica of Noah's Ark right next to the road leading to one of the world's busiest airports in Hong Kong. Mostly designed as a tourist attraction, it is located on a prime piece of property and has become one of Hong Kong's most prominent landmarks. Where the original Ark had three decks, this one only has, has actually five. Let's now talk a bit about the probable conditions after the flood and the possible survival of various organisms. A very interesting, albeit somewhat unknown fact, is that under calm climatic conditions, a large amount of biotic particles are present in the air. These particles include spores of fungi, ferns and bryophytes that are normally carried by air currents. Furthermore, various types of nematode worms and insects are great candidates for this type of air transport. Under favorable conditions, for example during a storm, even larger particles can be transported for long periods in the air. Depending on the exact conditions on, in the upper atmosphere during the flood, large numbers of small to medium sized seeds and probably insect eggs could have survived the flood by remaining in the air for the full period. Closer to the end of the flood, insect populations would have increased dramatically. They must have been present in huge numbers even before plants started to bloom for the first time after the flood. Some people believe that certain plants are unable to seed without being pollinated by insects, but this is not true. Various plants that are pollinated by insects will produce seed through self-pollination or wind pollination if insects are not available. This has been experimentally verified and confirmed by placing nets around flowers to prevent pollination by insects. Self-pollination did occur, although at a much lower rate than would have been the case if insects had pollinated the plants. Only a few plants are dependent on a single pollinator, but in these cases, the plant will still release a few seeds without the insect's contribution. Plants also reproduce vegetatively. Vegetative reproduction is where new plants grow from root stems and leaves and where the normal reproductive organs such as seeds and flowers are not involved. Let's look at a very well-known example, the specialized symbiotic relationship between the fig tree and the wasp. Only one specific wasp species pollinates one specific fig tree. If the wasp species is unavailable, no seed is formed. But this definitely doesn't imply that the fig tree's death certificate has now been signed. This tree will simply reproduce vegetatively until the geographic distribution of the specific wasp species has caught up to that of, th of the specific fig tree species. Let's get back to the flood. Vegetative reproduction could have commenced even before the flood waters receded. After the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883, that volcanic island near Indonesia that we spoke about earlier in, a, in another lecture. Huge numbers of uprooted trees were observed, many of them still in an upright position. Such uprooted trees are also frequently seen in the sea with fresh healthy sprigs growing from the stem. The trees were usually teeming with live insects and insect eggs. Some plants could have been buried during the early stages of the flood and survived when post-flood erosion exposed them. There is a surprising variety of plants and trees that are able to survive for long periods in a vegetative state even when buried. As an example, we can look at plants and trees that have been buried under volcanic ash. After they were dug up, after periods as long as eight years, they started growing again. A large variety of general vegetation can also survive in the soil that, in soil that is subjected to waterlogged conditions. Now there is no doubt regarding the hardiness of olive trees. They are able to survive disease, droughts, high salt levels and low temperatures more than any other evergreen orchard species. Not only do they grow in areas where there is limited soil and water, but also in very rocky areas below cliffs. This made it especially easy for olive trees to re-establish in the initially barren post-flood mountains. 
These trees are able to generate from almost any part of the tree, even from sprouts as short as 5 to 10 centimeters. They can even regenerate from branches that are simply pushed into or laid horizontally on the ground. Only six to eight weeks is sufficient for the tree to root, while shorter periods of 30 days are sufficient under optimal conditions. Some of the conditions that were prevalent during the flood must have contributed to the vegetative growth of olive trees. These trees grow better under low light conditions as well as conditions of decay. These conditions probably occurred when fragments of olive trees were covered by decaying flotsam. It's interesting to note that the dove brought an olive leaf to Noah. Keep in mind that 135 days had elapsed between when the Bible says the waters started to abate and the dove retrieved the olive leaf. It was at least 54 days since dry ground appeared. This is ample time for the olive plant to be producing new leaves from regenerated pieces. Seeds can latch onto a variety of floating structures, including the mother plant, pumice, matted masses of vegetation, seaweed, floating logs, etc. Seeds can survive for long periods as passengers in a dormant state, even when soaked in water. Experiments conducted by Charles Darwin provided evidence that garden seeds germinated after being submerged in salt water for 42 days. Darwin also pointed out that seeds survive in the dead carcasses of birds and animals floating in the sea. However, you still need to keep in mind that seeds are definitely not the only means whereby plants reproduce. Many seeds could have escaped the effects of the flood, including prolonged waterlogged conditions, because they were buried in early flood deposits and later exposed by erosion. Keep in mind that the flood has had as much of an erosive as a depositing effect. It is of course more than possible that Noah could have taken various seeds on board as well. Pumice is a volcanic rock that can float on water. It is formed when frothy molten rock cools rapidly, causing air bubbles to be trapped inside. Due to the eruption of so many volcanoes during the flood, it must have spread far and wide. It can float in the ocean for many years and huge blocks provide adequate protection to larger reef animals such as corals, crustaceans, mollusks, etc. Others may of course have survived the flood as passengers on floating objects as mentioned. Several salamanders have been discovered attached to wooden objects in the sea. In fact, amphibians are well adapted to this type of water transport as many of them normally lay their eggs on sticks, vegetation or logs that are in the water already. Several amphibians may have survived the flood by imitating aquatic organisms and living freely in the water. Let's now talk about the number of people. Where did the different races come from and what did they and all the surviving animals eat? Now the sons who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah and from these the whole earth was populated. Interestingly, the current number of people on earth make complete sense if it began with only eight people approximately 4,500 years ago. These are of course the eight people from Noah's ark, Noah and his family. To calculate the number of people on earth today, beginning with only eight, would require an exponential growth rate of only 0.45% per year. That is even lower than the current growth rate of 1.7% per year. In other words, if we take this growth rate, 0.45%, and we begin with only eight people at Ararat after the flood, it would have taken only 4,000 to 5,000 years to reach the number of people on earth today. Of course, that includes the effect of abortions, HIV, birth control, famine, disease, war, murder, etc. To simplify this even further, since the flood occurred 4,500 years ago, the population of eight would have had to double in size, exponential growth, 
30 times every 155 years to reach the 2013 world population figure of about 6.6 .6 billion. Now the Jews are descendants of Jacob, also called Israel. The number of Jews in the world in 1930, before the Nazi Holocaust, has been estimated at 18 million. Looking at the graph, the blue bars represent Israel and the green bars represent the world population. The 18 million figure represents a doubling of the Jewish population average, remember, exponential growth, every 156 years, or a growth rate of 0.44% per year since the time of Jacob. Since the flood, the world population has doubled every 155 years or grew at a rate of 0.45% per year. Do you see the resemblance between the two growth rates of the two populations? Doubling every 156 versus every 155 years and a growth rate of 0.44% versus 0.45%? Is it merely a coincidence? Most definitely not. It is similar because the true history of the world has been recorded in the Bible. If you are interested to see exactly how these calculations were done, please look at Don Batten's article on creation.com entitled Where are all the people? and see how ridiculous the numbers compare when looking at it through the evolutionist lenses. It's also explained in the book. Suffice to say this, for their idea of people being around for millions of years, this world is not enough to accommodate all of them. How does the evolutionist explanation regarding the origin of race differ from that of the creation scientist? Evolution requires the origin of millions and millions of new letters of functional genetic information by mutations and natural selection while creation science teaches the separation and rearranging of already existent genetic information as well as the loss of genetic information through mutations and natural selection. We already know that the number of variations resulting th from the combination of only two humans is 70 trillion. According to the Bible, all humans stem from Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives, and before that from Adam and Eve. And he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. The Bible further tells how the populations that stemmed from Noah and his family had one language and by continuing to live in one place, they were being disobedient to God's command to fill the earth, according to Genesis 9.1 and 11.4. This is why God confused their language and so caused the population to break up into smaller groups which spread over the earth. Modern genetics have demonstrated how variation in, for example, skin color could develop only over only a few generations after a population has broken up. It proves that all human races are biologically very closely related to each other, completely in accordance with the original ancestral population which were present when Babel divided into groups. Also interesting is the fact that there is only one main skin coloring pigment in the human race and the name of this pigment is melanin. The more you have, the darker you are and the less you have, the lighter you are. So in other words, there's not really a black and white skin, but only more or less melanin. About 10 generations after creation, a severe short bottleneck occurred in the human population. From untold numbers of people, the entire world population was reduced to eight souls with only three reproducing couples. Molecular evidence has revealed a previously unrealized genetic closeness among all the races of people, consistent with a recent origin from a small population source. Geneticists tell us that by looking at the mitochondrial DNA, which is only carried by the mother, 
We are all descended from one woman with three sublines. These sublines are the three mitochondrial DNA lineages, the wives of Noah's three sons on the ark. We therefore expect a maximum of three mitochondrial lineages in the current world population. And as it turns out, there are three main mitochondrial DNA lineages found across the world. The evolutionists have labeled these lines M, N and R. They would not say that these came from the ark. They claim that they were derived from older lines from Africa. It also turns out that M, N and R differ by only a few mutations. This gives us some indication of the amount of mutations that occurred in the generations prior to the flood. The mitochondrial DNA evidence is consistent with all humans being descended from a single woman as the Bible teaches, although it doesn't actually prove that there was ever only one woman in existence. And then there's the Y chromosome. A 1995 study of a section of Y chromosomes from 38 men from different ethnic groups around the world was consistent with the biblical teaching that we came from one man, Adam. Females have no Y chromosome. All of this denies the previously widely held and racism fostering belief that human races evolved their characteristics or the characteristic features during long periods of separate evolution. Scientists at the National Institutes of Health recently announced that they had put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome and the researchers had unanimously declared there is only one race, the human race. If you ask what percentage of your genes is reflected in your external appearance, the basis by which we talk about race, the answer seems to be in the range of 0.01%. Let's get back to the question on food sources after the flood. As the flood waters drained off, much seaweed must have been left behind in residual pools of water as a major food component. The large amounts of vegetation, including remnants of trees, which must have been stranded on moss after the flood would have facilitated the growth of many types of fungi, which in turn could serve as a food source for a wide variety of different organisms for many years. Of course, vast numbers of animals were killed during the flood. Some of the carcasses that floated in the water would have decomposed within two months. There are, however, several ways in which the decomposition of carcasses could have been prevented remaining intact until after the flood. Carcasses which sank into the water to a depth of 200 atmospheric pressure would have undergone a much slower rate of bacterial decomposition and in this way remain intact as carrion after the flood waters had streamed off the continents. However, even carcasses in shallow water could have been preserved due to a saponification reaction of body fat and water. This reaction leads to adipocere, the formation of grave wax. This enables corpses in water to be preserved for at least five years. So now that we've all lost our appetite, we may as well talk about the Inuit people. They collectively bury thousands of fish in pits to rot into a delicious jelly-like consistency. This is for all you sushi eaters out there. This jelly-like substance or sushi goo soup is enjoyed or slurped up by animals as well as people. The main source of carrion after the flood, however, was probably the carcasses that were deeply buried during the flood and later exposed by erosion. Carrion is a seasonally important source of food even for certain herbivores such as wild pigs but even elephants. Various fish would have been trapped in water pools on the continents after the flood waters receded. Now we've already touched on how the animals were able to distribute to other countries or continents over land bridges after the flood due to the sea level being much lower for a while than it is today and that was because of the ice age. Animals could also cross the sea on rafts consisting of floating vegetation 
This is something that has often been observed in recent times. Following the great earthquake off the coast of Japan in 2011 and the resulting devastating tsunami, a trail of debris formed in the Pacific Ocean around 100 kilometers long and covering an area of 2 million square feet. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, a tsunami was generated in the nearby Spirit Lake and this caused around a million trees to be uprooted from the surrounding hillside. These eventually settled on the lake as an enormous log mat. Now the effects of the Mount St. Helens and the Japanese tsunamis are nothing when compared with the destruction that would have been wrought by a global flood. On a much larger scale, the flood would have resulted in billions of trees floating on the surface of the oceans. These log mats would have been like enormous floating islands and regularly watered by rainfall. They could have easily transported plants and small animals over great distances. The ability of ocean currents to distribute floating objects around the world was clearly seen recently when thousands of bathtub rubber ducks were lost off a container ship in the North Pacific. Within just a few months, these had floated to Indonesia, Australia and South America and subsequently into the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. We often find plants distributed along coastlines and islands. The distribution of the sahu palm, for example, found in East Africa, Madagascar, the tip of India and parts of Indonesia and Australasia. Many animals also distributed to other parts of the world by humans. An interesting example here is reed frogs that were brought to Australia by humans. It took only 10 years for this frog population to spread over a distance of 2,000 kilometers. Frogs are not nearly as mobile as some other animals, for example rabbits, cats and reptiles. Animals had no problem to rapidly spread in all directions after the flood. In 1995, a few fishermen were quite fascinated to see how 15 green iguanas surfed on a natural raft at least 9 meters long onto a beach, colonizing the island of Aguila, a West Indian island. It was reported in the Daily Telegraph as well as in the October 98 edition of the Nature Journal. Since initially there was almost no competition after the flood, population growth must have exploded. This is especially true for insects, earthworms and rodents. These animals most probably comprise the bottom of the food chain after the flood. The populations comprising larger animals would have grown slower, only becoming ecologically significant at a later stage. Even the debris left behind after the flood would have served as breeding grounds for a wide variety of insects. Not only do blowflies thrive in rotting meat, but also in rotting vegetation and seaweed. These are usually the first insects to establish in a desolate area. Insects are of course legendary for the fast rate at which their numbers can increase. With a favorable intrinsic natural growth rate, a population of only one milligram of insects can exhibit a 120 billion fold population increase within only six months. If we apply only a fraction of this growth to the insect populations towards the end of the flood, we can deduce that they must have been present in great numbers, even months before the ark stranded. So these insects must have been a very important source of food for the ark animals. Rodents are also legendary for their rapid increase in numbers, especially when no competitors are present. Theoretically, a single rat pig can produce 15,000 babies within just one year. The abundance of insects must have contributed to the rapid increase in rodents after the flood, and the rodents in turn provided a food source for various carnivores, and definitely not only the small ones. Most, if not all, predators will eat rodents, especially when larger prey is not available. Lions can and will survive for several months by preying on medium to large rodents and rabbits. The same is true for leopards and jackals and cheetahs and wolves.
Even herbivores will occasionally eat rodents, especially when they occur in large numbers. Let's summarize. Great variation in animal and plant populations took place rapidly after the flood. An interesting example here in plants is the grass known as Pua Anua, which is normally an annual. This means that the, the grass completes its life cycle within only one year. Research, however, has shown how annual and perennial versions of the very same plant have arisen within only 25 years. This happened due to differences in the way rainfall occurred in two different geological areas where the grass occurred. Environmental stress would of course have been very common after the flood as the earth adjusted to the altered conditions, which in itself would have promoted speciation the formation of new species and varieties. The ark had more than enough space to contain all the original kinds as well as many other people on board. Unfortunately, they refused to heed and to listen to God's warning. In my book, I've discussed aspects such as food preservation, waste management, pest control and lighting in the ark. This as well as very interesting information on special dietary requirements of animals such as flamingos and colibris are detailed in Dr. Wood Murabi's great book, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study. In the next lecture, we'll investigate dinosaurs in more detail. Thank you.